Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm really excited about talking with everyone and getting some feedback on uh, how these I ideas intersect with things you're all thinking about. Um, so I'm used to um, like giving these talks as a pitch to people who haven't thought about complex systems like at all, because most of the field of astrobiology is um, concerned with looking for life on other worlds or solving the original life problem, but people really care about the component parts. Um, so when we're looking for life on other planets, it's things like let's find amino acids that should be indicative of life, or let's look for oxygen in an atmosphere, or if we're talking about origins of life, can we make the parts of life? And there's not a lot of systems level thinking um, in that field traditionally, although it's changing quite a lot. Um, so I see there a huge potential for the kind of work that we do in complex systems actually revolutionizing the field of astrobiology and enabling us to look for life in the universe and also solve the original life problem, um, which is a lot of what my group focuses on. Um, I'm happy because we're a small group today if you guys want to interrupt at any time. Um, so please feel free to, but I'll just go through things as they are. So I have an obsession <laughs> with the question, what is life? So um, even though I was trained in theoretical physics, um, I think uh, this problem is probably um, one of the deepest and most interesting problems. Um, and there are a lot of people that have thought about this problem uh, very deeply for a very long time. And I think that we're kind of a long ways from an answer from it. Although I think in say maybe the last decade or so, we've made actually tremendous progress because of some conceptual shifts that I've been seeing people have and talking about sort of more widely about the nature of life and how we can think about that problem. Um, and so um, a lot of it so from this sort of more fundamental perspective, asking questions about um, what is sort of the fundamental physics or nature of life that we might actually you know, extract some universal principles in the sense that we think about laws of physics. I think one of the first people to really articulate it that way was Erwin Schrodinger. So he's widely cited for this very popular book that he wrote um, called What is Life, um, where he was really asking about the question within the spatial boundary of an organism, how could you account for it in physics and chemistry? Um, but uh, he also admitted at the end of the book, uh, which I think is actually the most prescient quote of the entire book, is that um, he thought that living matter, while not eluding the laws of physics as established up to date, is likely to involve other laws of physics. Um, and as I mentioned, I'm trained as a theoretical physicist, but I work on this problem a lot, and I think I... Uh, agree with this statement more than sort of any other statement I've seen about life. I actually really do think that what underlies living systems is going to represent an entire new domain of physics. And it's not something that we can just take physics as we know it and sort of shoehorn it into the things that we call living or complex systems, but we actually need to invent sort of new um, fundamental descriptions um, at sort of a base level of reality. It's not just a descriptive um, formalism that works at some emergent layer, but there's actually some new fundamental laws that we need to discover that describe what life is and what life is doing in the universe. Um, that's my bias, obviously, because I'm interested in deep mathematical laws and things that we can consider quote unquote fundamental in the sense that theoretical physicists would be happy with. And whether or not that's true is obviously um, subject to speculation, but I think it's a worthwhile exercise. Especially in astrobiology, we have this problem that if you're studying complex systems on Earth, you don't have to worry about as much. Um, but we have this problem of trying to ask what is really universal about these systems such that we could actually predict what they might look like elsewhere. Um, and that's actually a really huge challenge that I think is kind of unique about the astrobiological perspective on these issues. So the kind of perspective I take, um, and I'm always trying to be upfront with my biases, um, is that I really do think that there are universal and fundamental rules in the universe that describe many phenomena that we see. Um, and so this quote is from Albert Einstein on the occasion of Max Planck's 60th birthday in an essay um, that he wrote honoring Max Planck, um, just about sort of the, the mindset of um, when people are trying to approach reality to come up with these fundamental descriptions. Um, so Einstein basically argued that the general laws on which the structure of theoretical physics claim to be valid for any natural phenomena whatsoever, and they should just eventually arrive at a description that includes life. Um, so, of course, life is not included in any of our laws of physics right now. Um, it is not necessarily contradicting any of them, but nor is it explained by them. And so that's sort of the conceptual gap that we're dealing with. 
Um, and so if you look at the structure of physics as it is now, I love this quote from David Krakauer. I think it's great. It's one of my favorites. I use it a lot um, that we have this idea, you know, like sort of the physicist conception of nature, there should be a theory of everything. Um, and you'll get, you know, sort of popular scientists, you know, talking about this theory of everything and how it explains everything about reality. But of course, um, those of us here that study uh, living things, minds, societies, no, it really doesn't describe any of the things that are most interesting. Um, and so, um, so this idea of a theory of everything being a theory of everything except those things that theorize, I think, is um, pretty telling of the sort of situation we are in fundamental physics. And there's good reason for that. Um, so if you look at the history of physics itself, um, and you look at sort of the early development of physics, a lot of the um, a uh, framework came in particular from Newton's conception of how physical laws should be written down. And um, he was very um, theological in his perception of nature. So he thought that the laws of the universe should actually be timeless and immutable and exist outside the universe. Um, and therefore we should come up with these sort of fixed laws of nature that exist outside the universe and we write the initial condition and then um, those laws do the rest. So it's a very sort of clockwork, godlike universe. Um, and we really haven't moved past that paradigm in the way we write down laws of nature. We haven't actually been able to account for where the laws come from or how we structure the laws and actually to include things like entities that build theories as part of the structure of those laws. Um, so I think, um, you know, part of the discussion we need to have when we're thinking about what is the nature of life and, and how we actually approach those problems is actually to think about the way that we talk about universal principles and laws themselves. Um, so if you're a physicist, um, or even if you're not, we have certain descriptions of nature um, that we know and love and we're very fond of. Um, and they describe sort of certain domains that we've interacted with. Um, and um, the ones that, this is sort of just a, you know, a snapshot of like sort of a picture of theoretical physics where it is now and where it might be going um, from my perspective, which changes on a regular basis. But um, you know, we do have pretty good laws that describe matter and light. And probably the best one of those is actually the standard model, which is one of the most accurately tested theories ever developed um, by humankind. Um, and then we have laws of space and simultaneity, which are really the laws of gravitation, and how um, you know, accelerating bodies behave in, in all of these kind of features, which are accounted for by special relativity and general relativity. And then we have laws that deal with when you can talk about average properties of large numbers of interacting systems and the parts are simple. Um, and we call those the laws of thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. But we get into this sort of regime in chemistry. Um, so chemistry is sort of the first scale of reality, I think it, that gets interesting from a complex systems perspective, because when you get to the scale of chemistry, you get this combinatorial explosion of exponential number of possibilities. And we don't actually know how it is, what the fundamental rules and laws are of how the universe navigates a space of possibilities that's much greater than could ever be physically realized. Um, and I think this is sort of the key point about when we're thinking about what is the physics of life and open it in novelty as we see it in the biosphere, um, that we really need to understand how it is that you can generate specific objects like people and cars and uh, cells um, reliably in the universe when there's so many possibilities when you get to that scale of complexity. I'll, I'll explain a little bit more what I mean by that um, as I go through the talk, um, but I think that's sort of the key um, the sort of key insight that we need to focus on. And obviously other people have thought a lot about that kind of space of possibility. So Stu Kaufman is well, one well-known one that's talked about the adjacent possible and things like that. So for me, I think when we're talking about the physics of navigating that space and what biology actually is and is doing, um, it's really about the laws of information because you need to specify why certain things exist and not other things. And that specification comes from the things that exist themselves. Um, and so, um, so when I'm thinking about sort of what's the future of physics, um, I'm working on something called assembly theory, which I'll talk about at the end um, of the talk, like the, the last part of the talk, but which is very related to complex systems ideas. But there's a lot of sort of ideas out there that I think are kind of um, in this space of ideas. Um, and I'll just mention them briefly now, and then if we want to talk about them more in the discussion, that's fine. Um, but there's some some things about um, like causal set theories of quantum gravity have a lot of these kind of features where they're really talking about causation actually being the fundamental feature of reality, and then like space and and what we would consider even well time is causation, and space actually emerges from that, and then you can talk about properties of physics from basically a causal graph. And Stephen Wolfram's project is based on this idea, but there's a lot of work in quantum gravity also based on this idea. 
Um, and then constructor theory is, is another sort of new proposal of a theory of physics that deals with what's possible and impossible and why. Um, and so their aim is actually to restructure the laws of physics as impossibility statements or possibility statements rather than dynamical laws. Um, and of course, in complex system science, we deal with the very um, many degrees of freedom uh, type of complex systems that may actually you know, require information for the way that they work um, and obviously have uh, many parts. Um, so, so something in the space of ideas, I think, is actually going to lead to really sort of new fundamental physics. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But when I say information in the physics of the possible, um, what is it that I'm actually like really trying to get at? Because I think there's a core concept here that's really important. Um, and I am primarily an original life scientist, but I think um, when we're thinking about the problem of life, um, how we think about it is actually needs to be much more abstract and much more general than just applying to the origin of chemical life. Um, so if you look at the history of physics and you look at sort of all the fundamental transitions we've had in our understanding of reality, they always come with some level of abstraction that unifies a lot of phenomena that seem completely disparate in their properties at sort of a superficial surface level. Um, and so most of what I'm trying to do is actually look at the evolution of the biosphere as a whole and including the technosphere and then ask questions about what would be sort of the unifying principles all the way from this transition we call the origin of life all the way up to what we're doing now as a technological civilization and how do we account for that with some kind of framework that's sufficiently abstract to explain all of that but also explain what other biospheres might be possible. Um, and so for me, it really comes down to this idea that there are some transformations in the universe that require physical systems to have quote unquote information or knowledge um, in order for them to happen at all. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, these are very sort of anthropocentric examples, but I think they get to the point. If you look at sort of Earth uh, right now with all of our satellites around our planet, our planet is the only one we know of that's anti-accreting. So we're basically building little metal boxes and we're launching them into space on a regular basis. Um, and we can do that process reliably um, in the sense that we can do it over and over again. So it's become basically a part of the physics of the surface of our planet that we can do this. Um, and the reason that's true is because we have acquired through our evolutionary history and the history of development of knowledge in the human species, a deep knowledge of the laws of gravitation and engineering principles to make that possible. So planets don't anti-accrete unless you have intelligent physical systems on the surface of the planet that have that kind of knowledge. It's just a physical transformation of launching satellites into space that doesn't happen without evolution and acquisition of information first. Um, and the same thing with um, looking at the periodic table of the elements, you can actually, you know, parse out every element in the periodic table that we know about um, by the physical mechanisms in the universe that produce it. And once you get to the highest atomic number elements, they are certainly possible by the laws of physics as we know them. Otherwise, they wouldn't happen, but they're not probable and they aren't produced in high abundance, especially when you get up to like 118, which is the limits of our current technology. The most reliable process in the universe for making those elements is actually technology. So technology now becomes a part of the physics of explaining if you see uh, certain elements, it, it indicates that you had a physical system that had knowledge of the laws of nuclear physics. So there seems to be some deep correspondence between our minds and what's actually physically possible. These are just two examples. And I think that that is not just a property of human minds, obviously, but it's just a generic property of um, biological systems and, and what we would call life. Um, and so, so when I'm thinking about sort of um, the long arc of the history of human thought, but also um, physics in particular, um, you know, we've had this sort of history of unifications that have taken things that traditionally seemed completely different to us and then um, unified them in some sort of more fundamental understanding. So um, I think, you know, one that was particularly radical, at least for me when I think about it, is uh, how Newton and Galileo unified terrestrial motion and celestial motion. So for all of human history before that, people thought that the motions of the stars and the heavens were completely decoupled from the motion on Earth and there were no unifying principles. But somehow they had the insight to recognize that, you know, the reason that the apple falls from the tree is the same reason that the moon is going around the Earth. Um, and so those are huge um, uh, 
conceptual insights into the nature of the way our reality works, but they also require a very deep level of abstraction because you basically have to abstract them to these kind of core ideas that don't really always look like the phenomena we see in nature. Another one is unification of space and time, right? It's not really obvious for me sitting here that um, I'm sitting in a gravitational potential well and, and space time is actually curved around me because I'm in the presence of the earth. Not at all intuitive to my senses, but a good explanation for how we can explain the properties of gravity and, and other things that we observe. Um, and so, um, so this list of unifications actually came from a nice paper by Frank Wilczek about physics in a hundred years. Um, but I think, you know, sort of, we have to think when we're thinking about solving the problem of life, where are we going and what kind of unification might happen in the future. And, um, and so sort of one of the proposals that I make is it's actually unification of the way we think about information and computation and the way we think about matter. Um, and I don't mean, let's take the theory of computation and, and treat things at like material substrates as computers. I mean that there's some deeper description that accounts for what we think of as computation and what we think of as matter. And it may not look like either of those things um, at a surface level, but it actually like explains those sort of phenomena and features of our universe. In the same sense, you know, like space time wasn't directly perceptible to us. And, you know, you had to do a lot of reasoning and connecting ideas in particular, starting with the properties of light and going all the way to gravitation before you could actually see that that was the underlying structure. Um, and so, so the origin of life is sort of a unification problem in this sense, because we can't actually understand the origins of life because we don't have the right physics to understand it. Um, and so one of these sort of arguments here is that there are laws of physics not necessarily laws of light, but these are laws of physics that have to do with the physics of information and how information is actually a physical thing. Um, and it also is, is deeply related to the nature of causation, what causation is in our universe. Um, and from those laws, we can derive the properties that we associate to phenomena we call life. Um, and it's sort of in the same sense that we, we're pretty accepting of the idea that the laws of physics are universal um, and gravity in particular. So gravity applies everywhere in the universe. Uh, gravity is not useful for talking about what happens inside an atom. It is very useful for talking about what happens at the scale of planets and also at the scale of galaxies and the large scale st structure of the universe, right? So, so that's sort of the domain of that physical theory. Physics of information or whatever we wanna call this new physics is also universal, but it actually doesn't become the dominant physics until you get to a certain complexity scale in chemistry, um, which we would call the origin of life transition. Um, and so in some sense, you can think of us as sort of, you know, the place, the, the places in the universe where the physics of information is most apparent um, in the same sense that like a black hole is the place where gravity is, you know, at its strongest. Um, so, um, so I've been working on this idea for over a decade now, I guess. Um, and we're starting to converge on some ideas in the theory um, that I, I will be talking about. Um, but the, the essential idea is, is just as I said, that life is the physics um, it, where physics of information starts to be dominant physics. And why I say this happens in chemistry is for a very specific reason that um, when you are building up molecules, <laughs> Um, even small molecules that might have just a few elements, the combinatorial explosion is so huge, you can't make all possible molecules, even with six elements in them, for example. So um, there have been estimates that there's like 10 to the 60 molecules, uh, which is a ridiculously huge number, just with an atomic um, mass of less than like 600 AMU. So that's about the size of two amino acids. Your, the proteins in your body are hundreds of amino acids long. So think of like, you know, two amino acids, 10 to the 60 possibilities, how many possibilities are there for all of the macromolecules in your body. It's too huge for the universe ever to produce them, um, all of them. Um, and um, and then we, we see specific ones produced because life has an evolutionary lineage that learned how to make those specific ones. Um, and so, so information has to be a part of the explanation for the existence of specific objects once you get to a certain scale in chemistry. Um, and so, um, so this is sort of the, the big conceptual overview of my entire sort of line of research that I'm interested in how we think about things um, and what our team is doing and our collaborators um, is basically to think about the transition from non-living to living physics. So how is it that information starts to become important when, or, or causation or whatever the word is that we wanna use to describe this? Um, uh, when you transition from non-living to living systems. And as I said before, you know, this is a pretty uh, deep and abstract way of thinking about the nature of life, right? You know, typical definitions you might get for life are things like life is a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. 
you should be able to derive that idea from a deeper theory um, as part of this proposal. Um, it's not inconsistent. It's just not, you don't have an explanation and a prediction when you take sort of these surface level definitions. So we're looking at life much more abstractly and trying to talk about sort of explaining the entire evolutionary process. So when I think of, if I wanted to define life based on the theoretical construction I have in my mind right now, it would be that life is the process of how information structures matter across space and time. So we have one example of life on this planet because we have one original life event that mediated this transition to this kind of physics. And this kind of physics is basically one that propagates out in space and time and takes over the entire planet and then probably eventually will take us off planet. Um, and it's interesting to think about the planetary process itself actually reproducing on other planets via technology. So, um, so there is this sort of long arc and a continuum in the processes of life as we understand them. So my group does a whole bunch of different things to try to tackle how we can possibly get at um, some of these philosophical ideas and turn them into, um, you know, sort of more rigorous theories, testable ideas, um, connect them to experiments. Um, and so um, I'm going to talk about just a couple of them today, not all of them. I'm not going to talk about intelligence at all or what we've been doing with consciousness. Um, but I am going to talk a little bit about um, assembly theory that we've been working on that I mentioned, um, and also some of the ways that we're thinking about building a statistical mechanics, basically for biochemistry, um, which is trying to abstract away from the chemistry of life as we know it on Earth and build these sort of more general universal models, um, which ties some into universal signatures of life. Um, so fundamental principles of life, um, one of them is probably got to be some kind of universality, because if we're talking about a phenomena we call life, um, there has to be some universal features of that phenomena. And part of like this sort of philosophical introduction that I've given is that I think that those universal principles are actually quite deep and quite abstract. So when we look at life on other planets, it might actually look really different. Um, even at the chemical level, let alone at the technological level. I mean, I don't think that we're even in a position to be able to predict what other technologies might look like, but we might be able to predict or build rules about what, what how they should behave. Um, so this principle of universality is really important, um, but it's one that astrobiologists have really struggled with. Um, and part of the, the thing that we're trying to do is actually identify life elsewhere in the universe. So usually, um, you know, astrobiologists won't, won't draw it this way, but because I'm trying to think about life as this fundamental physical phenomena that happens in the universe, um, you know, what really the sort of research paradigm we have here is trying to understand how much of the universe looks like us and what do we mean by looks like us. Um, and so, um, so this is really what we're trying to do, but we have to say that there's some features that we have in common. Um, and one of the biggest stumbling blocks about this whole enterprise when you're an astrobiologist is that we only have one example of life on earth. Um, and that example is um, basically a bio, at the level of biochemistry, right? So if we look at sort of biodiversity at our scale, it seems like there's a huge amount of biodiversity, but if you look biochemically, it's actually um, fairly boring. <laughs> Most organisms share the same basic biochemistry. Um, and this allows us to trace uh, phylogenetic trees back in time to this idea that there was a last universal common ancestor on the early earth for our all known life. Now this ancestor is probably not a single cell. It was probably a population of cells undergoing some collective evolution, um, but still there's sort of this surface um, that we can re retrace genomically. And then we don't know if there were other life forms that emerged on earth or that was the only one. So we have this one example to go on. Um, and this leads to sort of um, a problem that the, at the genomic level, the last universal common ancestor is a little bit like a surface of last scattering. It's really hard to get information about what happened before this because we can't retrace it through phylogenetic trees because we basically hit this boundary of everything converging in the past. Um, and the last universal common ancestor had a lot of the modern molecular machinery. It was a fairly sophisticated um, chemical system. Uh, so we do have traces of it in genomic data across the surface of the earth, but, um, and, and the earth itself has been shaped by the biosphere's evolution over the last few billion years, but getting back to the sort of origin event or events that happened on the surface of our planet is quite hard. One important concept that emerges from this idea of a last universal common ancestor is the way that people think about universality in biochemistry. 
Um, and so universality in biochemistry is this idea that because life on earth shares component parts, we can talk about universal biochemistry in the sense all organisms use DNA and, and RNA and proteins. Um, and there's certain reactions that occur in every organism associated to that and certain compounds. Um, so um, the basic building blocks of life on earth are universal for life on earth. Are they universal for other life? We don't know. Um, and so Norm Pace has sort of speculated that, you know, the building blocks of life anywhere should be similar to our own in generality, if not the detail. The problem has been we don't know how to generalize because we have this one sample problem. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work trying to figure out um, whether we can take more of a systems level view of biochemistry and actually extrapolate principles that might be more universal in the sense that we would talk about universality in physics rather than the way we talk about universality in biochemistry. Um, so in physics, there's a, another concept of universality. It's a really different concept of universality um, because biochemical universality is like universality in components at the micro scale. Physics has a concept of universality where systems behave a similar way across many systems, um, irrespective of their component parts. Um, so usually this happens, um, or you'll see it most in the uh, physics of phase transitions, where we can define something as a universality class if at the phase transition um, there's similar scaling coefficients for um, observables um, at the phase transition itself. So for example, the liquid gas critical point and the ferromagnetic critical point, even those, though those are really different physical systems, one's the transition from liquid to gas, one's um, you know, from a magnetic to a demagnetized system. Um, they have similar properties, so they're they're taught they're they're discussed in terms of a universality class of physics because their behavior is the same at some macro scale of organization. So one of the questions we were interested in and have been working quite a lot on in our group is to understand whether biochemistry has macro scale universal universal properties has universality in the physical sense, not just in the biochemical sense, because you can imagine if we can um, extract extrapolate such principles from biochemistry, we might be able to use it pr to predict other members of the same universality class, i.e. other kinds of chemistries for life. Um, and so, um, so this is kind of a research program that we call planetary systems biochemistry. We just got a really big NASA grant um, for working on this stuff with a bunch of collaborators, which is pretty exciting. Um, but the basic idea is to do something um, people here are pretty familiar with, which is to um, abstract uh, reaction networks, all the biochemistry that life does onto a network and then study its properties. Um, so this is a representation of planetary scale biochemistry. Basically, these are all the known cataloged um, uh, reactions catalyzed by enzymes across the planet. Um, and then what we do is we basically look for scaling laws um, that are associated to some property that has some regular behavior across um, different members of, of a bio biochemical population, different um, kinds of biochemical systems from individual organisms to looking at the ecosystem and then understanding the properties of this biosphere level network as a single data point because we only have one biosphere and then trying to understand if there's any features of that that are unique or predictable. Um, and so um, to do this, because it's, it's basically taking this kind of statistical mechanics approach, we need to build uh, ensembles. Um, and so we do that by taking um, thousands of uh, data points of genomic and metagenomic data where they've been annotated. So you know the functions of the genes and you can basically um, you know, take the genes, um, find the enzymes and then find their function to construct these reaction networks. Um, and so we have uh, many, many <laughs> um, examples of life across Earth from different environments and things that we're basically studying patterns in their biochemistry. Um, and what kind of molecules and reactions um, they use and also what the network structure is. Um, and so one of the sort of early results um, that my group uh, generated based on this, um, and this was led by Harrison Smith and Hanju Kim, um, was to demonstrate that if you look at the um, topology of the networks, um, so you take a biochemical system, you know, if, whether it's an E. coli or a, an ecosystem set of reactions from some metagenome that was environmentally sampled, so just an environmental sample of a community of organisms, um, we see really regular scaling behavior in the um, topology of the networks and also in terms of like just reactions versus compounds and some other measures that I won't include in the talk because I don't want to go into too much detail. Um, but so, so basically life does display sort of universal features across scales in its network structure. 
Um, and so one of the features of that um, scaling is driven probably, we would conjecture, by the presence of these universal set of shared reactions and compounds that I mentioned before. So all life on Earth has some overlap in its biochemical space. Um, this is what we mean when we talk about biochemical universality. So when, um, you know, if you're thinking about partitioning and statistical mechanics, there's actually some information shared between all the partitions because they have um, uh, shared component parts. So what we wanted to do was actually sort of randomly sample the space and not conserve that feature. So we're not randomly sampling all of chemical space, which would give us even a better if we were just sampling the uh, biochemistry that, um, uh, or the chemistry that bio biochemistry actually uses, but do some random sampling where we're not actually conserving function across different samples. And if you do that, um, so the shown in gray in the back here is the original data sets of um, uh, all the individual organisms and ecosystems. So again, as on the previous plot, each dot is just representing an individual or ecosystem. And then what we did was we random sampled reactions so that we had the same comparable number of molecules in the reactions as in the real biochemistry. Um, and these are just two network measures. So they have sort of similar scaling behavior, but they are statistically distinguishable in terms of um, being able to tell the difference between the randomly sampled reactions and the actual biochemical reactions. And some of the consistency in the scaling behavior probably is arising because we're sampling the same small part of all of chemical space. So if you imagine sampling chemical space, you would probably get even more divergence. Um, but the, the key takeaway here is that um, random sampling doesn't uh, recover all the features that we associate to life on earth as far as this invariance and in network properties across scales of organization in the biosphere. It, requires a, it recovers a different kind of invariance, but not the one that we actually see in biochemistry and it's, it's distinguishable. So, um, so what we did was actually do another sampling where we controlled for the universal component part and we were able to recover most of the features that we see for the specific scaling that we see in biochemical networks. Um, and so a lot of the, the invariance across, of biochemistry across scales of organization is really driven by this um, shared component part. And so for those of you familiar sort of with networks, um, you know, each biochemical network is roughly scale free. They don't exactly fit a power law. In fact, most of them are actually not power law. Um, but if you imagine that you have some overlap between those networks, depending on the structure of them, you start adding them, you might build up random networks or you might continue to build things that have a similar degree distribution. It turns out that biochemistry actually maintains that similar degree distribution across scales. And that's basically what this is recovering um, because you have that shared component part and the way the particular structure of the overlap in those networks. Um, we've done a little bit of experiments about sort of the, the variability of that, but, um, but we haven't really gotten into as much network analysis of that as we would have liked to. Um, so anyway, um, so, so this is just sort of summarizing and showing the data for that point that if you um, uh, control for there being more components that are shared across the systems, you recover much more of the, the feature. So some of the other network properties and other variables that we looked at uh, were more different than what's shown here. Some of them were more similar. And overall, you can still statistically distinguish real biochemistry from these um, randomly sampled ensembles, but it does show that that universal component is playing a large role in this universality across scales. Um, so sort of the key take home here is at least that scale invariant topology biochemical networks require this universal set of biochemical reactions for life on Earth. Um, so I'm going to jump into sort of another part of this work, which is thinking about coarse graining, um, because it gets more interesting if you, um, you know, an, a network projection is one kind of coarse graining, um, but there's other ways of coarse graining biochemistry. And coarse graining obviously was really important in thermodynamics because, you know, you have a temperature and it allows you to describe the properties of many systems that have different microstates but have that same macroscopic observable. And when we're talking about statistical mechanics of biochemistry, we want to find out what are those macroscopic observables that we could use to constrain properties of alternative chemistries for life because we would ex expect those macroscopic observables to be the same. So the one I just showed is I, I would expect a planet to always have a universal set of biochemical components because I think that scale invariance property is related to robustness of biochemistry across scales. Um, but what we're going to look at here is, is sort of a different component of biochemistry, which is actually the reaction diversity and the kinds of reactions used. 
Um, so enzymes have functions, uh, so they catalyze specific reactions. Um, so the one I've shown at the bottom here is just alcohol dehydrogenase. Um, the details don't matter so much, but what does matter for purposes of discussion here is just that you can group enzymes by common function. And at the highest la level of this grouping, the first digit and what are the, called these enzyme commission numbers that people use to catalog enzyme functions, um, you're, you're pretty broad. So this just in EC1 includes all redox reactions. And if you look at it at the level of the first digit, there's actually six different functions that have been pretty well cataloged. There's actually a seventh that was added, but we didn't include it in the study because it was added when we were doing this work. Um, and so you can think of this as actually a coarse graining biochemical space in terms of function, high level function. Um, and so what we wanted to do was actually ask whether any of these statistical regularities that we started to observe with the networks, whether we could also see them in things that were more chemically, um, like more rooted in the actual physics and chemistry of what biochemistry is using. And it turns out that, um, in fact, we did find scaling behavior, um, but just to sh sort of show the, the pipeline, um, you know, you can actually go through and take each genome or metagenome and you can count the number of enzymes with each first digit, each primary digit, so each major function, and then you count them and you, you bin them together. And then basically you can look at the statistics of um, the total number of enzymes in each class and the total number of enzymes. Um, so this would be like the fraction of uh, basically showing how much of oxyreductase function there is as a function of the total enzymes in the system, enzymatic function. Um, and so these are the scaling behaviors that we observe. So just as before, each dot on here is an entire biochemical system. So it's an individual uh, tax or phyla, so an individual species, you may think, and um, or an individual ecosystem. And when we look at the scaling behavior, um, we do see universal behavior across um, data sets, um, the data sets being the three domains or the ecosystem for certain um, enzymatic function. Um, so oxyreductases always scale super linearly as do hydrolases, transferase, ligase, and isomerase are consistent with sublinear scaling. So uh, isomerase has this outlier in eukarya that is more consistent with linear scaling, but still consistent with sublinear. So you could feasibly cast, cast classify this as having sort of a universal behavior. Lyases are a bit, bit of an oddball, but they actually have um, similar function to hydrolases. They both break apart molecules. So if you group those together, you see consistent superlinear scaling uh, across scales. And so, um, so in our paper um, on this, um, uh, we actually identify five universality classes where we group the hydrolases and lyases together. And so it does seem to be the case that even though there's variation in the scaling coefficients across the data sets, there is universal behavior. And that variation across the data sets really has to do a lot with sort of how you bin your data and, and some sort of detail. So we really have to understand the variation. Um, and it might be the case that these are variations because of sampling and there is some underlying physics we could describe um, that describes all of these scaling behaviors in these functions and would predict particular scaling exponents. And we're working on, on those kind of models now. But as far as for this paper, um, what we were trying to do is ba basically demonstrate one, biochemistry has universal properties that are at a statistical level. <laughs> Um, so more universal in the sense that they are in physics, but also that they're not dependent on universal shared component parts in biochemistry. And so to do that second part, we actually went into each enzyme function and we rank ordered them by how common they are across each data set. So this is showing a rank ordering. If you have a data point at one, it means it happens um, as I'm pointing here in all our archaea. And then we just rank ordered them by their frequency distribution. And you can assign an area under the curve score to those curves. If it's closer to one, it means that that set of components is more universal. If it's closer to zero, it's less universal. Um, so just narrowing in on, on two particular examples as a case study, oxyreductases have very low uh, AUC scores. So they have very low universality compared to other enzyme classes and ligases have very high universality. So ligases tend to have more shared component parts um, than oxyreductases do across different biochemical systems. Um, and this allowed us to make the argument that the universality classes that we're observing are actually not explained by enzyme universality. Um, so what's shown in the right here is just that there's not really a strong correlation between AUC score and scaling coefficient. In fact, we found no correlation. So just to give you an example, uh, oxyreductases have um, the least 
uh, common reaction functions shared across individual organisms or ecosystems, yet they have happen to have um, the tightest scaling coefficients across our data set. So we see really tight scaling behavior for things that have very diverse parts across biochemistry. Ligases are the opposite case. Ligases tend to be shared by everything, and they have very widely varying scaling properties. So there's not really any direct correlation between these things. Um, and so we could conclude basically that these macro scale features might be things that are universal in a physical sense. Um, and so one of the projects we have now is trying to decide if, or determine if we can use these kind of scaling properties to actually infer what happened beyond that genomic boundary at LUCA. Um, so could we predict um, in a statistical ensemble sense what the properties of the most ancient life on earth had to be um, in terms of the diversity of the reaction function. So of course, this is making several assumptions about um, you know, sort of the distribution of reaction functions being conserved over uh, um, geological time scales. So one of the things that we're working on now is actually mapping them on phylogenetic trees um, to be able to determine whether we can actually do that or not. Um, and this is just some of the scaling fits for that. I'm gonna skip over that in the interest of time. Um, another set of projects that we work on that I won't talk about in too much detail is actually doing network theory for exoplanets. So I have this kind of idea in mind that with this kind of statistical approach to planetary biochemistry, we can build um, models of planets and the kinds of statistical properties we expect of the chemistry to be on them. Um, if we want to predict the properties of other biospheres on other planets. Um, and so we're working forward in that direction. Um, basically, like eventually I'm hoping to take, you know, the compound distribution on a planet and build some machine learning algorithms to grow biochemical networks, like ensembles of them. Um, but we're also working backwards from atmospheric data and observations right now. Um, so we have some projects where we're taking data from exoplanets and trying to reconstruct sort of the atmospheric networks happening on those planets and determine what, how the DC equilibrium features are actually driving certain network properties so that we can eventually build these models of exoplanets that are basically exoplanets as complex systems. All right, so in the last um, little bit of time I have left, I'm going to try to finish up fast so we have a little time for discussion. Um, I'm going to talk about assembly theory, um, which I mentioned in the beginning, um, which is another sort of complexity-based approach to thinking about life. Um, what I was just talking about with the biochemical networks is very deeply connected to the sort of first philosophy part of my talk, um, but there's sort of, it seems like it might be a little disconnected from this idea of physics as information, but I really think about sort of the molecules themselves as a physical structure that is an information variable or has information in it. Um, and assembly theory is basically trying to capture that intuition in terms of thinking about molecules as causal diagrams, basically. And a molecule has a causal structure to it, just like I have a causal structure to it, to me, or like my phone has a causal structure. Um, and so what we wanna do is basically describe things that exist in terms of um, this causal structure and then build up a theory that describes what life is doing in terms of changing um, sort of properties of the, that causal structure, what we think about as information actually being causal in terms of assembly. So that's sort of like the, the long-term goal. Um, and part of the, the motivation for this is, is really motivated um, by the Schrodinger quote I gave earlier, but also this, this Albert Einstein quote about how one can feel best feel in dealing with living systems, how primitive physics still is. So when I talk about sort of thinking that life needs new, new physics, I don't even mean life needs new physics in terms of we need new dynamical laws of motion like Newton wrote down or like the laws of quantum mechanics are general relativity. I mean, we need an entirely new paradigm for physics because an initial condition and fixed law of motion do not describe anything about what the biosphere is doing. And even Darwin saw that when he talked about endless forms, most wonderful and beautiful being evolved in, contra uh, in contrast to Newton's fixed law of gravity, right? So he had that deep intuition when he was coming up with the theory of evolution. The problem is that we haven't been able to really connect all of that to sort of a deeper understanding of reality and the way that we do in physics yet. Um, and whether or not that's there or that's important is subject to debate. But in my field, when I'm worrying about the origin of life and looking for life elsewhere, is it seems like a critical step that we have to make. Um, and of course, there's there's sort of contrary views. So I felt like I had to put Stu's um, contrary view here that the world there is a world beyond physics. So 
he thinks that maybe there is no law like evolution of the biosphere, we won't be able to describe it. Um, and I think there's some merit to those proposals, especially in context of like, does the universe genuinely produce novelty um, or not? If it does really produce novelty, that things that certain things that come into existence are completely unpredictable based on the structure of past things that exist. You can think of it like a prime number. You can't predict a prime number based on previous numbers that have existed. Um, then, then that structure for the universe would be quite different. Um, and that might be that might be something that we actually have to adopt. And we think about that a lot in assembly theory, but I don't necessarily want to talk about that too much right now because it's in a little bit um, more challenging. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning um, that chemical space is huge. Um, and one of the things I'm interested with trying to explain life is understanding what principles explain why some things exist and not others. So it's actually sometimes um, when I'm when I'm kind of giving more popular level talks about the sort of physics I think that governs life, I talk about the physics of life as a physics of existence. Why does this thing exist and not this thing? Um, and how is it that the things that exist generate more things that exist. Um, and in some ways, I think about the physics of life as maximizing the number of things that exist because there's a lot more novelty in our biosphere than there is in empty space and certainly on other planets. Um, and so biology seems to have a unique role in sort of generating structure and generating information and generating um, new possibility spaces. Um, so in assembly theory, um, what we do is we don't do that forward process of trying to predict everything that could exist. We look at things that do exist now, things that we can observe, and we say, um, what is the sort of uh, structure of this object, all the possible ways of forming it, and then how likely it is to see that object in the absence of information or in the presence of information. Um, and what I mean by that is like you take a molecule like ATP and you can break it down into its basic bonds and then you can build a model molecule back up and of course there's a huge tree of possibilities of building molecules ATP is just one of them based on that set of bonds. Um, but ATP will from all the ways that you actually end up getting at ATP ATP will have a shortest path in that space um, and that shortest path is what we call the assembly index. It has a little bit of the flavor of things like algorithmic information theory or logical depth or conglomerate of complexity, but it's not the same because it's actually computable. So it's not like um, a, a computational measure of uh, complexity, um, like some of the some of those um, that have this issue of being too hard to calculate. Um, although we do run into issues of having it be too hard to calculate under some circumstances. Um, but the more important feature of why it's distinct from sort of previous approaches to talking about these things is an observable property of a molecule. Um, so it is actually a physical attribute of the molecule in the sense that when we put a molecule into a mass spec experiment, what we do is fragment the molecule apart. And those fragments are actually pieces of the assembly space. Um, and the fragmentation pattern actually has a direct correlation with the assembly index. So you can actually have a measure of complexity of the molecule that is observable in instrumentation we have in labs today. And this is why I actually started working on assembly theory because this whole sort of experimental paradigm and the basis of the theory was developed in my collaborator's lab, Lee Cronin. Um, but for me being somebody that's interested in fundamental physics applied to origins of life, the fact that we now had an observable, <laughs> something we can measure in the lab as a tool and a scaffold for starting to build theory was like critically important um, because you can't build theory in a vacuum, it has to be testable. Um, so the assembly um, theory so far as it's been developed is primarily in terms of thinking about biosignature science. And so what we've been trying to do, and this is mostly in Lee's lab, although my lab has been helping on the theory, um, is trying to actually take non-living and living samples and demonstrate that only living systems um, produce molecules with high assembly index. What does that mean sort of conceptually? It means that if you have that shortest path in the space is sufficiently long, you would never expect random physics and chemistry to be able to nav navigate that combinatorial explosion to produce that object. What you actually need is a system with information about the specific steps, something acquired through a selection, for example. Um, so you actually need a biological or living system or living physics to be there in order for that molecule to exist at all. Um, and there's a subtlety to the argument here because mass spec actually requires 10,000 copies of a molecule in order for you to even observe the molecule. So it's not just that you might be able to produce that molecule once in the entire universe, um, but you'd never actually observe it. To, in order to observe 10,000 copies of it, it means that you actually do have to have that information processing mechanism, that mechanism that knows how to produce it um, in order for that molecule to exist. Um, and so um, what um, they were able to experimentally verify is that 
um, there is a threshold in assembly space um, of a, at about 15 steps where biology seems to be the only physical system that can cross that threshold. Um, or, or you could think an information processing system would be the only one that could thrust, cross that threshold. Um, that was actually theoretically predicted because at that sort of number of steps, you expect to get less than one in a mole copies of a molecule. So you, it wouldn't be something that you could ever observe. Um, and so there's kind of this um, existence argument here that the combinatorial space is too large. You need a system that knows how to go a specific path. And if that path is sufficiently long, uh, we expect only information evolving systems to get there. Um, and, um, and so this is just another sort of um, map uh, from the paper. So um, the paper um, my lab contributed to that came out on this um, in Nature Comms uh, last spring um, is listed here that has all this data in it if anybody's interested in taking a look at it. Um, but again, so, so this sort of regime here with high MA, um, what I call the high assembly universe, is, is, is that regime of uh, physics where the information has to become the dominant physics, that one I was talking about before. So this is sort of how we think about it in terms of an observational signature. And also, what are we talking about when we're talking about sort of um, the the assembly space that objects exist in um, and how, how the physics of those spaces goes. Um, so this is actually really um, exciting time uh, to be working on assembly theory because there are some NASA missions that are thinking about flying it. Um, so we might be able to actually use complex systems type approaches to detect life on other planets um, by looking for um, assembly. Um, and for me, what's more exciting is actually trying to build this into a lot of the intuition that I've been building over the years about what is necessary to solve the physics of life. Um, so when we're talking about assembly spaces, we basically think, um, you know, all the things that we see um, existing have this kind of causal structure where you can actually talk about the possible histories of their formation. And that, that becomes sort of the object that you work with in the theory. And, and what we're trying to do is basically talk about how that generates novelty and where, what does information look like in those spaces and how do you actually get to the high assembly universe and these kind of things. And I think some things that we, we commonly think about in terms of origin of life science will, will come up in that theory. And I'm really excited about it. Um, and just to, to finish up in the last minute, um, all of this is, as I mentioned, um, becoming increasingly experimentally tractable. So I don't like doing theory in a vacuum. Um, I actually want to see the problem of the origin of life solved in my lifetime. So it's really important to have a deep um, collaboration between experiment and theory. Um, and so um, this is um, another um, paper from uh, uh, Lee Cronin's lab that we contributed to, but uh, it's also important because we're trying to build um, this kind of equipment here with Hillary Hartnett and Everett Schock. Um, where basically um, what we what was done in that sort of earlier work was taking sets of molecules and subjecting them to different environmental conditions and taking this apparatus, which is called a computer, um, that is a roboticized um, uh, basically laboratory that you can run many experiments in parallel to basically statistically explore um, what are the patterns in chemistry you get from different planetary environments. So we're trying to build equipment to basically do this kind of exploration in real uh, geochemical environments with uh, geochemically informed constraints um, with my ultimate goal <laughs> to see in my lifetime, um, a massive international collaboration for the origin of life built where we can statistically explore chemical space to look for life or the emergence of this new physics. This picture here is not an origin of life experiment. It's a physics experiment called Super Kamiakande where they're looking for proton decay, which is an event that we've never observed in our universe, but is theoretically predicted. So they're trying to bound the lifetime of the proton in this huge volume of water by looking for neutrino signatures of the decay. So you can imagine if we built um, you know, a massive um, robotic system that could explore chemical space and do the analytics and we could simulate many planetary surfaces all at once, we could actually start to imagine trying to actually explore the possibility space of, of where life emerges um, in chemistry and, and where does that physics actually start to take hold. Um, and then the last part is just this is the geocomputer schematic from our NASA proposal that we're going to actually be building here at ASU in the next couple of years that's going to start trying to do this. So not at the scale of Super Kamiakande, but a scale of 96 experiments in parallel, for example, which will at least give us some statistics to work from. And we can start to map to those statistical approaches I was talking about earlier in the talk and some of the experiments in Lee's lab. And so I'm really excited about that. Um, and I will end on this quote, which is another one of my favorites, um, because I think it's very telling about the difference between physics as we know it and physics of life as it 
will hopefully become to understood. <laughs> um, base metals can be transmuted into gold by stars and by intelligent beings who understand the processes that power stars and by nothing else in the universe. And I also want to thank um, my lab members, particularly Hanju Kim, who's been critical to all of this work, um, and Dylan Gagler and Bradley Karras led the enzyme stuff. And then also to our collaborators, Chris Kempies was critical on the scaling law stuff. And I mentioned Lee already. So thank you all. And this is just for purposes of next time. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you, Sarah, for this tour de force. Uh, I'm sure that nobody could absorb everything because there was so much in there. Um, questions? Well, I have one. So, with this framework of assembly theory, so if we extend it out, uh, so there is the assembly that is possible by living system, and then there is the assembly that is possible by us in technological context. Yes. yes. Does the scaling law change? Um, I think so. We're, I actually am like deeply interested in looking at that because there's like two major transitions, right? There's like the transition from abiotic to biological and then life to mind. And I think technology can do things in the space that are impossible for biology to do. Um, and so we are trying to look at that. It turns out to be really hard to parse the, the data. Um, so for example, this is some of the stuff that we talked about with you with Hikaru, but um, yeah. when you're looking at like some of these large chemical databases, it's not necessarily clear where the boundaries are. This molecule is only human made and this molecule can be made by nature. Um, and so we're trying to figure out better ways to parse the data to actually get at that. But you can look at, there's obvious ones, like uh, the largest molecule other synthesized, I forgot what it was, is like, I don't know, it's got like a hundred million atoms in it. It's like very clear nature would never produce that. And I do, we do have some intuition that molecules themselves can be techno signatures because you would never expect anything but technology to produce that molecule. So, so there has so to be a threshold in that space. Yeah. So basically you have a way uh, in if those missions work sort of for the detection of life, you mm -hmm. could sort of add the detection of intelligent life. Yes, yes, that's the goal. But the, pro the problem with the remote detection is most of the molecules that they detect remotely are very small molecules. So we right. have to build up better inference tools for saying whether embedded in those uh, reaction networks are high yeah. assembly molecules and what would be the highest assembly you would expect. Ryan. Hi, Sarah. Uh, thanks for Hi. the talk. Uh, for some reason, my video is not working. But um, uh, so I like this. Uh, oh, here, maybe this. Okay. Um, I liked this uh, assembly measure of complexity. I thought that um, was nice in the sense of measuring sort of these uh, spaces that life gets into. That's very difficult for non-life to get into. Um, yeah. But just to sort of play devil's advocate, because I, I think you don't like this definition of life that's like basically replication plus selection mm -hmm. or something like this. Yes, I hate it. Uh, <laughs> Mostly because everyone else loves it. That's the only reason. Sure, sure. But, um, but it, to play devil's advocate here, so it couldn't sort of replication plus selection produce similar things, right? Um, things that have a high assembly scores. Yeah, so I actually, um, uh, probably, yes. Um, and, but possibly, I think that you actually, I think there might be some subtleties there about sort of the reliability of that process and things associated to it. But I do have some deep intuition that if you want to get to high assembly things, you have to have a copying process in the past, yeah. right? Yeah. So you, you need to be able to copy knowledge of specific transformations into the future in order for them to actually be able to even build up this way. And then also you, some selection mechanisms. So I don't think that that's not a feature of what we're talking about. Um, yeah, exactly. So there's additional features. So for example, one of the things I think about is I, I so I don't think replication plus selection is the driving force. I think it's necessary to get there. But then you want to ask the question, what is the physics driving things when they get into those high assembly spaces? And for me, that's much more of an exploration creativity process, because I think the principle there is actually maximizing uh, assembliness, maximizing the number of things mm -hmm. the and mm -hmm. maximizing the connectivity, the causal structure and things like that. So I think replication is kind of it's it's um it's a property that comes with it's not the property if that makes sense yeah thanks okay shinbei thanks for a really brilliant talk thank you so much uh, sarah so um 
so 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 for example, um, the, I guess the two questions are bundled together. I was wondering if um, one question is question of observables. If we're thinking uh, in terms of let's say felt meaning or affective qualities of experience yeah. or politics, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, where a lot of the uh, it may be hard to get observables because a lot of that kind of operative knowledge is tacit. Is tacit. It's hard to even extract it, even if you just talk to the people yeah. directly. Right. So, so could it be uh, it possible to make a theory that um, doesn't need <laughs> to know uh, really what the parameters or the observables are in advance? Okay. Um, that's one one question. Okay. Yeah. You want to have a physics account, account that you would consider a kind of physics. Okay. Or maybe not, in which case it's not really part of the domain of physics to explain those kinds of qualities of experience. We could say that, and that's fine too, right? Yeah. That's fine. It's the ambition to discuss things like that, because if you could, then you could say, say well, we've discovered you know, life, we discovered some species on another planet, but would they colonize us? You know, would they have yeah. an imperialistic colonial, colonial attitude with respect to us or right. not? That kind of question. Yeah. I think it'd be fair to say, look, Physics doesn't account for that kind of question. Yeah. That's outside the domain of physics, which would be fine, yeah. you know. But yeah. if you really want a theory to account for that kind of thing, that's where it's going to be where, where the rubber hits the road. Okay, that's yeah. one question. Yeah. No, I second love question, I love this. Yeah. yeah the second I... question is Kaufman, right? Okay. Uh, who says that the same argument about the complexity of the of the space of uh, of expressible proteins? Okay, expression space is so large. He uses that argument to 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 to, to argue that there are no entailing laws at right. all. Okay. I know. Yeah. So, so I mean, but then against that, you can say, well, what about Jeremy England's kind of work with thermodynamics, where it's the thermodynamics of structure, the emergence of structure, and the dissolution of structure itself is built into a term as an extra term for non-equilibrium thermodynamics. So, so maybe, okay, both are both. You can say, but maybe both statements are okay. There are no general entailing laws from Kaufman, yeah. and yet there are some kinds of maybe extensions of thermodynamics because we could say that, well, okay, well, physics can. Physics, as Longo says, Giuseppe Longo says, you know, uh, conditions but does not determine life. Right. So it's not our job to talk about those kinds of aspects yeah. of life which are not, deter yeah. not determinable. What do you um, say? <laughs> yeah, this this would be great for a, a long discussion. I would love I would love to dig into it. I um, I, I mean, I certainly think there's like a boundary to what physics um can accomplish, but at the same point. Uh, I, actually, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the best way to get into this, but I think um, what we're doing as sort of, um, say, physical systems that build theories and have sort of a deep understanding of reality is itself something that we need to explain. And for me, there must be some kind of description that accounts for that feature of us. Um, and so it's almost like doing physics at a, a meta level, right? So now you're doing the physics of physicists. Um, <laughs> And, and so I guess from that perspective, I, I, think, I think there must be an explanation. Um, and so when I say physics, I mean explanation. Now, whether it's a mathematical explanation or not, I think is another question because that ties into, um, you know, sort of more the traditional conception of what physics is, um, you know, is mathematizing everything. Um, but uh, yeah, so... Um, so, and I, yeah, so I think that, like the way we think about things in assembly spaces, I mean, there's a lot of the assembly space you'll never observe, right? But you you kind of have a sense that it's still a physical feature of the molecule. So if I would think of myself in assembly space, I'm actually all the possible histories that the universe could use to generate me. We have an intuitive sense that there was only one history that the universe actually went through. But I think you could ask the question of whether or not that's true. And sort of the virtual space of all the things that, you know, could have created me, but didn't is still, that information is still here in the system because I exist. So it's sort of like living systems actually have this sort of access to these spaces um, that are, um, you know, like you think of the adjacent possible. I think Stu was really onto a lot of things with the way he talked about that. Um, but I think what we're trying to do it in assembly is say that certain attributes of that space are measurable so we can get an idea of the shape of the whole space. Um, and, and some of the things that I would associate to human creativity and what we're doing, I would say are features of that space. But again, I am so biased as a physicist. I don't know how to get out of that mindset. If you can help me get out of the mindset, that'd be great <laughs> um, because I'd like to know what else is possible, but I'm always trying to think of, of what are the laws? What are the laws? How can I predict? Um, yeah. So I'm just happy to be in the same school with you. Okay. That's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> same. Okay, we have one more, Warren. 
Yeah, I'm reluctant to uh, ask this question because my uh, aging brain cannot follow the rate at which you talk. Complex, uh, pile so many ideas on each other that I can't really follow. But there was one that caught my attention when you were complaining about the, or uh, noticing the difficulty of defining life. You used an example, I think, um, mm -hmm. life is a self-sustaining chemical system or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and you sort of dismissed that for some reason. Yep. Uh, and I wonder if you, first of all, did I get that right? Did I understand yes. you right? And can you uh, give me a better explanation? Explain again why you found that unsatisfactory. Um, so, it's life is a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. The first thing I take issue with is defining life as a chemical system. I think chemistry is the scale of reality life emerges, but I don't think life is at all chemical. I think it's a much broader and more abstract phenomena. So for example, mm -hmm. I think a lot of our technology is examples of life and is just as live as the molecules inside us. Um, and there's a lot of emphasis on Darwinian evolution. Um, and then that becomes problematic because you can't be a Darwinian system unless you're a population of systems. So it doesn't actually mm -hmm. apply to individuals. Um, and so, and then self-sustaining is also problematic because there's not really any individual system in our biosphere that is independently self-sustaining. So it might apply to the entire biosphere as a whole, but of course the biosphere is not Darwinian. So it actually, it just has so many issues with these words that people just like stuck together because they apply to life. But like, mm -hmm. when you think about it, like you break and every definition that people propose for life has these issues. Um, it's not possible to define life. I think it's possible to derive the features we associated to life from some explanatory theory. But I think defining life is, is the wrong approach. And I think it's, it's the approach that the field of astrobiology has taken for decades. Um, and it has just continued to fail to the point that you'll get, um, you know, Nobel laureates studying the origin of life, like Jack Shostak saying uh, definitions for life do not help us solve the origin of life. Um, like people in that field just kind of, they hand wave about it. They don't worry about the definition of life at all, which I think is one of the reasons that prebiotic chemistry hasn't solved life because they don't seem to think it exists. <laughs> um, so uh, there's a problem there. Okay, thank you. That clears it up, thank you. Okay, so Sarah, many thanks for the stimulating yeah. talk. Thank you. Uh, and um, I see all of you uh, for, in two weeks when we have Shinwei doing a presentation and I guess next week at a faculty meeting. So uh, lots to discuss in both places. So thanks again, Sarah. And thank you all. It was fun. <laughs> Good to see everyone. Bye.